All right, everybody, you should be able to hear me now. That should get everything set up. So everyone should be here for the webinar, APA Editing, How to Avoid Common Mistakes. Uh, for those who are who are new here, I am Dr. Johanna Broussard, and I will I'm one of the qualitative mentors here with Statistics Solutions. We are a full service dissertation consulting and assistance company, and we will discuss that more at the end of this webinar. Um, a few things to go over. Please be sure to raise your hand and then type your question in the Q and A field. Um, also. We do not have the time in the webinar to go over individual questions regarding APA formatting. This is to help you recognize some of the more common mistakes and how to set yourself up for formatting success at the beginning of the dissertation process. So specific questions will probably not be answered. We do offer APA editing services. And that is something you can talk about with Janine, whose email is on the screen right now. But that said, let's get started with our webinar on APA editing, how to avoid common mistakes. So let's go over some of the basics to start off with, with grammar and style. Um, first thing we need to think about is the voice that we use when we write. APA prefers the use of active voice, which is true across most other scholarly forms of writing as well. I have much more experience as an editor with Chicago, and Chicago prefers active voice, MLA prefers active voice. And so keep in mind when passive voice occurs, that's when we are either hiding or not clearly presenting the doer of the action. So an example of active voice, the researcher conducted the study in a controlled setting. We know clearly who is conducting the study, the researcher, because it is stated and it is the subject of the sentence that is performing the action. Active voice tends to use active verbs. The passive version is the study was conducted in a controlled setting. Notice how the subject of the sentence, the study, is not the actor. The study is not acting. The study was acted upon. That's why we have the use of a helping verb to be to give us the verb form was conducted. This is something that we'll find usually appearing in chapter three. And it is and it refers to your own study and the steps that you took. That's why we asked for, or that's why your chair will likely ask for the researcher will, I will. APA is moving toward allowing first person, but generally speaking, third person, the researcher is preferred. So be sure to check with your with your chair if they if they if they're comfortable and some fields are also more preferable to third person. But you can find some exceptions when the emphasis is placed on the recipient, you know, your participant. So to fit again to fix passive sentences, make sure the subject is the one performing the action. Participant seven said, the researcher conducted. The data collected showed. So this is what we mean when we talk about active versus passive voice. It's very easy to slip into passive. But when you want to make sure that your researcher, that you're using an active voice, that's where you focus one on action verbs. 
the verb needs to be something that is done, not something that is. And you need to make sure that the subject of the sentence is the one performing the action described. Anthropomorphism is another thing that we need to think about. Anthropomorphism is the act of attributing characteristics to inanimate objects and to ideas. So the researcher found the following results is a correct way of saying, talking about the results. Whereas the anthropomorphic way, the study found the following results. The study is an inanimate object. It is a thing. Therefore, it cannot find results. APA is very picky about avoiding anthropomorphism. And so being, so being clear on that and being clear on who is actually doing the action, who is finding the results, who is performing the study, these are things that we have to think about. Similarly, in your literature review, it is correct to say Smith, 2004, discussed the turnover rates for correctional officers, as opposed to the article discussed the turnover rates for correctional officers. The article does not discuss, the article does not speak, the article does not present the ideas. It is the author who discusses them in this particular article. Now, some people might be saying, but we all understand that this is what this means, right? Why is it such a big deal? And yes, we do understand it, but for APA style, this is a very strong convention of avoiding anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism is something that is common and accepted in fiction, but in especially in academic writing, we want to be clear and we want to give credit to the people who are acting, the people who have written. And so we want to avoid putting emphasis on the product, but on the performance, the performer, the author, the speaker, the participant, the researcher. So this is why anthropomorphism is one of those things we really stress avoiding in APA. Tense use. This is one of those things that you'll probably write your proposal in the present and future tense. This study seeks to explore the following situation. When can, when this, I, you know, I will collect data in, by doing the following because you haven't conducted the study. You haven't collected the data. You're in the process of doing it. And therefore at your proposal stage, you tend to write in the present and the future tense. However, once you get your proposal approved, you need to go back and edit and rewrite things in the past tense. And you will then continue to write the results and your discussion in the past tense. This is what was done. This is what was found. This is what the study has. This is what this is the meaning that is attributed to these findings. And so we will talk about them in the past tense. Also, in your lit review or when referring to literature in your methods or your introduction, always use the past tense. Smith, 2000, stated, found, confirmed, because you are then referencing that which has already been completed. So generally speaking, if you're writing your proposal, Tell us what you are doing and what you will do, present and future. Once you finish, you move on. You are presenting something that is already done. You, so you switch to the past tense. Especially, this is especially true for your methods 
and for your disc and for your findings. You need to you need to make sure that you switch these so that way when you get to your conclusion and to your discussion, you are discussing what was found. You are discussing what it what the findings imply in the past tense. Capitalization. As someone who grew up speaking German, English capitalization is very different. So let's go over the rules for English capitalization in the APA style guide. Major first, you need to capitalize the major words in titles and headings. So living with your eyes open. Specifically, any word that is four letters or more needs to be capitalized. And so in this instance, you would capitalize prepositions and adjectives like with and your. If, you're, if you happen to switch to a different style guide because the journal uses a different style guide, that may have to be changed. So keep that in mind. Journal titles should always have the words capitalized. So the PMLA would be capitalized. Um, Speculum, which is the Journal of the International Congress of Medieval Scholarship. Um, I'm trying to think of a few others off the top of my head. Southern Political Review. Southern Political and Review would have all of those words capitalized. So references to titles of sections within the same article or document, such as in your literature review, need to be capitalized as appropriate. Proper nouns, names, places, titles, Adjectives and nouns used as proper nouns, trade names. So Xerox, Father Gascione, Pope Boniface VII, um, President Truman. While President is not Harry S. Truman's name, it was his title. And so when referred to that specific president, President Truman, President Obama, President Washington, President Lincoln, the title is capitalized. Nouns followed by, by numerals or letters. Participant one, research question two. Titles of tests, inventories, or questionnaires. The Minnesota Multifactor Personality Inventory would be titled. The Multifactor Leadership Questionnaire would be titled. But, but theories are often not titled. So critical race theory. If you are writing out the words critical race theory, they would not be capitalized. The acronym CRT would, however, be capitalized. And so let's talk about with capitalization, when don't we do it? In APA, in reference list titles of books or articles, only the first word, the first word after a colon or an M dash, which is the really long dash and proper nouns. So here's an example, Henderson JC and Ving Traman N. Notice now we move into the into the title of the piece, strategic alignment, where only strategic is capitalized, but not alignment. There's a colon, so leveraging is then capitalized, but information technology for transforming organization. You can see how the capitalization changed. I know this is a lot to go over. Don't worry. You will receive a recording of this webinar with the PowerPoint, so that way you have this as a reference. 
Also, we do not capitalize indented paragraph headings. We don't capitalize the names of law, theories, models, statistical procedures, or hypotheses. And we also do not capitalize the shortened, inexact, or generic titles of tests. So if it's generic, if it's shortened, if it's not precise, it doesn't receive capitalization under APA. Now let's talk about abbreviations and acronyms. You want to avoid overusing abbreviations and acronyms, keep the use sparse, but you want to make, but it needs, but it can help you save space during the, during the writing process. So, you need to determine whether the space saved from an abbreviation justifies the necessity to understand the meaning. Will it be clear from the context that, that what this acronym means to the, to the average into intelligent, educated reader familiar with the, pro, with the process? We'll talk about a little bit that more in a second. Here's an example. The advantage of the LH was clear from the RT data, which reflected a high FP and FN rates for the RH. Without any context, those abbreviations mean nothing to a lot of people. Generally, generally speaking, you might wanna consider the first time on a page writing out what these things mean, and then in parentheses putting, as you can see, the acronym, the abbreviation right after it. So that way there's a frequency of familiarity and it can be easily referred back to. If, the, if what the abbreviation refers to isn't clear by context or proximity, you might want to write it out again. So again, you know, if you're not using it frequently, you know, three or fewer times within a paper, spell out the abbreviation or the acronym. So patients at several hospitals completed the MMPI-2. If you're using, if you're infrequently using it, write out what MMPI stands for, or the, for, the rule of four. If you're using it four or more times, you can start to have an abbreviation or an acronym, but it needs to be spelled out first. So again, on the first use, you write it out completely, followed by the acronym for parentheses with this example the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, which is the commonly accepted acronym for this US governmental organization. Same thing with United States versus US. Per APA style guides, only use the abbreviation of US as an adjective for US Navy, US foreign policy. But when it is used as a noun, you need to spell out the United States. APA is finicky. And so that's why we need to think about some of the common mistakes that we as specialists see from those who are using APA style guide as students. Now let's talk about numbers. So when do you use numerals? Well, Numbers 10 and higher should get a numeral versus words. So you would write the number 10, one zero for the number 10, but you would spell out N-I-N-E for the number nine. Numbers that represent time, dates, ages, scores, and points on a scale, as well as the exact sums of money, two-year-old five years, item one, $3.57, receive numerals. With 
this one exception. We use words for approximation of days, months, and years. So approximately three weeks, almost two days, around seven years. When there is precision of time and temporal time and money, use a numeral. When it is an approximation of time, use a word. And when things are abstract, always use numerals. So when do you spell out the, the numbers as words? If the number begins a sentence, a title, or a heading. So we always start a sentence with a word, we start a title with a word, and we start headings with words, not with numerals. Common fraction, one third, one half, four fifths. And if it is the universally accepted usage to, to, to write something out as words instead of numbers. So there are some times when the previous rules, numbers 10 or higher, represent time or represent abstractions will be violated, but it is only when it's accepted usage and those are rare and you probably don't need to worry about them too much. But focus on knowing the basics and knowing when the generals of using of writing numerals versus spelling out the numbers as words, and you'll be fine for about, I'd say about 95, 96% of the time you're writing out numbers in one form or another. Now, one of the biggest issues that we see comes with citations and references. And so let's spend some time talking about that. First, plagiarism versus paraphrasing. You need to cite when all of the information is not your own thought or your own ideas. So even if you're summarizing the findings of an article, you know, these aren't your ideas. You're, they're your words, but they're not your ideas. And so you need to cite it. Using proper citations strengthens your credibility as a researcher. And this goes the other way. If you don't reference the sources you cite, and if you don't cite things properly, it looks like you're, you're doing, it looks like your work is sloppy and people will start to think of you as being sloppy, even if you're just making mistakes with your citations. So here are some basics for your reference list. If you're not coming, if you're coming from a field that uses a Chicago or MLA, this would be called your work cited. It needs to be alphabetized by the last name of the first author. You need to cross check it with the text Make sure everyone you're citing in the text is in your reference list and make sure that every reference list entry has an in-text citation. All online sources must include the retrieval information. So the DOI, which is a change from APA 6. So you will need to have the DOI format but does not need to include retrieved from. So you don't necessarily need the database, but you do need to have the DOI, which is the URL that you get from you know, doi.org. That is essential. So that way the, the online source can be found. So there are two main ways you're going to reference an article within the text as the subject of a sentence, which you can see here, Smith et al, open parentheses, year, close parentheses, found. 
or at the end of the sentence. Researchers found that da 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 open parentheses Smith et al. comma 2012 close parentheses period. This is how we cite in the body of our document, whether it be a paper, a dissertation chapter, or a manuscript we're submitting for journal publication. And again, any source cited in the text needs to be found in full in your references. If it seems like I'm stressing this, this is something that's easy to forget to do. It's easy to have missing or stray citations. Before I started working for Statistics Solutions, I was a college professor. This is one of the most common citation mistakes that students make at all levels. You'll cite it in your text, but you'll forget to put it in your works in your reference page. You'll cite it in your reference section, but you'll forget to put it in the body. Often the latter occurs because you edited something and you removed it from the body, but you forgot to check to remove that source from the references. So there's a lot of checking and cross-checking across your document that needs to be done to make sure that all of the sources cited in the body and in the references align. Now, let's look at the APA writing and formatting rules. Headings. Headings are important. Headings help us navigate the document. There are several different levels of headings that you can use. The first level of heading, centered, boldface, title case. This is often your chapter heading. Like, like chapter four, results will be a level one heading. A level two heading, which might be uh, data collection, descriptive statistics, data analysis findings. These will be flush to the left-hand margin, boldface with title case heading. Then the next level, level three, which will be something like, say, I've been working with a, quali with a qualitative result, so theme one, theme two, theme three. The th your themes will be flush left, boldface, italic, with title case. Level four, which would be like sub theme one A, sub theme two A, will be indented, bold face, title case heading with a period at the end. And then if you have level five, which are pretty rare, indented, bold face, italic, title case heading ending with a period. Those are rare, but you may have them depending on the complexity of your study and of your findings. So keep this as a reference. Keep an APA style guide handy as a reference so that you have example after example and more thorough descriptions than you can get from a one hour webinar. Uh, writing your style and grammar and using bias free language. If the gender is unknown or irrelevant, the, the singular use of they is both acceptable and preferred. Also, if you are, if one of your participants or one of the scholars you cite has made it known that they use they, them as their personal pronouns, use they for them. A lot of people are unfamiliar with the singular use of they in English. It does, however, go back to the Middle Ages. We find it in Chaucer and other major poets of the day. So it has a long history. If, you're on, if, if the people you are talking about is unknown, describe them as them. If someone who will read your document is unknown to you, use they to describe their gender. If 
you if it's not important whether, whether the person is identifies as male fe or female use the singular they also the singular they helps to maintain participant confidentiality when used also consider first person person first language which and here are some examples. A man who is living with epilepsy places the person first as opposed to an epileptic man. People living in poverty as opposed to the poor. Similar could be people experiencing homelessness as opposed to the homeless or the unhoused. Put the people first, and the, as opposed to putting the condition or the situation first. Also be specific whenever possible. Korean Americans versus Asian Americans. Cisgender men versus men. If, especially if such differences between cisgender and transgender are important for your study. If they are unimportant, find ways to be as generic as possible without showing bias. And it's easy to mistake, to, it's easy to, to not realize that we are showing bias, especially things like person not not being familiar with person first language but APA does prefer that we write with person first language we put the people and their humanity before the condition or the situation and again specificity when possible because the experience of Korean Americans is not identical to that of Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, Vietnamese Americans, or Malaysian Americans, but all are grouped under the broad, generic, unspecific Asian Americans. So that's why we talk, we, we focus on specificity. Now let's talk about your tables and your figures. Tables and figures are formatted in parallel and they need and they follow the same format. The number is bolded, the title is italicized, there is a heading and there is a body. So as we can see, whether it be a table or a figure, table one, figure one is bolded. The title of the table, participant demographics, is italicized then you will have your headings column one column two which uh, then you will have your body number one number two so this is how we write it out from this from the from the identification of the table to its titling to the headings you know that might be participant age biological sex, years of experience, and then the numbers, the body, participant one, 19, male, two years experience, and so on and so forth. Here's an example that you can see. You want to limit the use of borders for clarity, and we don't use the vertical borders, so the left and the right on the cells, we just use top and bottom. Tables can be placed either within the text of the paper or within the appendices. So here's an example, table two, results of curve fitting analysis, examining the time course of fixations to the target. So we can see the headings, logistic parameter. We can see all of the different headings we have. We can see the different parameters and we can see all of the entries for each for nine-year-olds for 16-year-olds for the t for the p and for the cohen's d i'm trying to move as quickly as i 
possible we do have a lot to go over, and I would like to give you guys time for some questions if you have any about APA formatting. But this is what a table will look like. Now, again, I've already we've talked about in-text citations before, but let's go over the writing of them. All sources with three or more authors must use at all at the beginning with the first use. So, you know, um, instead of Smith, Jones, and Baxter, Smith at all. There is an exception. If two papers have the same first author, but different second, third, fourth, and fifth authors, you will need to write out the author names to help differentiate them. So if you have Smith, Jones, and Baxter, and Smith, you know, Smith, Jones, and Baxter 2012, and Smith, Johnson, and Friedman 2012, you then have to write out the author's names. So that way they can be easily differentiated. In your references, this is where it can be, this is where references take up a lot of page space. We include all authors up to the 20th author in the reference list. So we write out first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, et cetera, up to author 20 when we are writing the authors for an individual reference. 20 authors is rare, but it has been known to happen. DOIs and URLs are presented as hyperlinks for electronic sources. We do not use retrieved from unless we are saying, unless you are writing out a retrieval date. And retrieval dates, especially for web sources like um, a blog or a governmental website, the dates matter because sometimes when those get updated, those entries change out, those entries disappear. They might get archived so they're no longer at that URL. And so that helps us and that helps readers understand that, okay, this is this is when this information was current on that website. It may have changed. Sometimes for space on a server, old content gets deleted. Sometimes it gets moved to an archive file to save space. So that's why the retrieval date gets retrieved from or retrieved on, retrieved by, accessed on if you're in MLA or Chicago. So that's why that is the exception. Few other helpful tense tips. Uh, keep up with formatting from the beginning. If you keep up with from the start, you have less to worry about at the end. Keep a running list of references and keep checking against your in text citations. Citation managers like EndNote, Microsoft Word has a references function that you can use to create both a reference page and an in text citation. It's tedious when you're starting out, but it really, really helps. Okay, we have... Doo -doo 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 -doo. In the references list are plain text versions versus hyperlinks of the references, such as uh, citations and in APA format as well. If by plain text you mean the standard journal inch where you got where you got the text citations, all everything that you would use from a print source needs to be there for everything. But if it was accessed online, you have to add the URL and the DOI. That is the only difference. Everything has to be there. Citation managers in Note Microsoft Word have fields that you fill out. The neat thing is with, I know I've used Microsoft Words in the past. When you 
if you have to switch from one uh, style sheet to another, APA, Chicago, MLA, Turabian, Harvard B, you can click a button and it will update parentheticals and it will update references automatically, which is very, very helpful. They're not perfect. They can be clunky, but it helps you move things much more swiftly. Keep a copy of the APA 7 style manual or go to Purdue OWL, which is Purdue University's online writing lab. They have an online style guide with all the example, all examples, including sample papers. Because APA style, MLA even, Chicago, these style guides are not something you need to memorize keep, but you can use the reference to go back to when you need it. Having a style guide handy is, can be pretty pricey up front, but it's an investment that it's worth having. If money's an option, like I said, the Purdue Online Writing Lab, Writing Lab, Purdue OWL, is free and available to the public. And so that is something that you could easily make you so. And we got a few minutes left, so let's do some Q&A. We've had one good question. If someone else has any questions, I will open the floor for questions. Questions, questions. I know typing questions is awkward and it can take a while, but just I'll give you a few minutes. Like I said, uh, APA style or any style, regardless of your discipline, is something that if you keep up from the beginning, if you know enough of the basics for books, journal articles, um, government reports, that should, that should be enough to get you started for most of the sources you'll be using. Know how to write them and cite them. And if you can do that from the beginning, it will take care of most of your issues. And other things you can easily look up in a style guide or the Purdue OWL as you need them. You don't have to memorize the style guide. Look, I've been a college professor for over a decade. I have taught APA, MLA, and Chicago. And I haven't memorized the style guides. I have to look them up as well. One, they change regularly as we, as we learn better ways to cite things that are clearer. And as new types of sources, like online sources, become readily available. And two, because it is a lot of information and it's easier to have the style guide handy so you can reference it when you need it. Okay, going, oh, we have a question here. Okay, if you don't have the original document, can we cite a secondary work or a technique or a statistical test? Uh, the answer to that is there, you would normally have to say quoted in because you are not, they are, you're not, cite, you're, you, citing a citation is a bit awkward, but I'm trying to remember, I know APA in Chicago, no, MLA in Chicago allow you to say quoted in, I believe APA does as well. I know sixth edition did, but again, check. That's why you get a style guide. It's always better if you can get the original document. And if you, if you can't access it through your school's library database, your friends at the interlibrary loan office might be able to help you get it. So you might want to think about that. Or you might want to think about if the scholars are still alive, sending them an email 
and see if they can get you the doc a copy of the document. Do your best to try and get the original, but quoted in is an acceptable way to cite it if it is cited in another. But if it is only referenced in another, that's where it's getting problematic. And so I, I have always advised students, if you can, you can quote someone who quotes another, if the quote that they give you is direct and cited, but don't, para, don't quote a paraphrase and act like and say that you're quoting a quote. So quote. So that that's where the, that's where the line gets murky, and you really want to you want to avoid anything that's questionable because your credibility is impacted. We have something in the chat. Yeah, APA 7 is a boogeyman, Kathleen. I will be honest. It was something that was that my last year of teaching started came came around and I was like, wait, wait. There's a lot of differences. APA changed things a lot. MLA changed things a lot. Chicago has been a bit slower. OK. Ganya, you are welcome. So let's see, we have time for a few more questions. Question one, or going once, going twice. Okay, guys, so if you do need further help, Statistics Solutions is a full service dissertation consulting company providing graduate students and other scholars with timely editorial support for your dissertation and other scholarly products. We can help you all the way from topic selection, topic generation, through your dissertation defense and preparing your dissertation to become a published journal article. For information about our services and to receive a complimentary 30 minute consultation that is available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern United States time, please contact Janine Glace at Janine at statisticsolutions.com or phone number country code 1-877-437-8622. Remember, you will receive a recorded copy of this webinar with the PowerPoint to help you. And as a final reminder, Purdue OWL, Purdue P U R D U. E O W L is a wonderful free online resource for APA, Chicago, and MLA style guides that will help you. That will, that can help you as well. Should you need something quickly or at weird hours. However, should you need further services, we are here and we are both competent, capable, and happy to assist you. I am Dr. Joanna Broussard. I am the qualitative research mentor. So if you are doing qualitative work, you will probably be working with me. If you are doing quantitative, you'll work with one of our quantitative specialists, David or Justin. And we wish you all the, all the success academically, professionally, and personally. I hope you have a lovely afternoon. Stay out of the heat, get some rest, drink some water, have a nice meal. And I will now be with that. I will bid you all adieu.